We now commence with lesson eight in uh, the section in the part of uh, William Walker Atkinson's The Arcane Teaching called The Life of the Ego. <clears throat> lesson eight is called Metempsychosis. And here we go. Metempsychosis. It is not our purpose to enter into a discussion of the world-old and worldwide doctrine of metempsychosis, rebirth, reincarnation, or re-embodiment, or by what other, whatever other name it may be known. The modern world has awakened to a knowledge of this ancient doctrine and truth, but in learning, but in learning it, it has absorbed much error with the principle of truth. We shall not attempt to prove the doctrine of metempsychosis. All true occultists know that every soul which ever has experienced re-embodiment or rebirth has an intuitional assurance of the truth of having lived before, sometime, somewhere, an assurance perhaps dim but, but still persistent. Those who have not had this inner assurance in some degree have never experienced rebirth. Although they may have rebirth awaiting them after the present earth life. To those who have not this inner assurance, it is folly to attempt to prove metempsychosis. At the best, they will receive it merely as one of a number of idle speculations on the unknowable hereafter. To those who have the inner assurance, in some degree, no other proof is necessary. Although explanation and teaching regarding the same, is eagerly sought after. In this and the following lesson, we shall ask you to consider the arcane teaching regarding the details of metempsychosis, reincarnation, or rebirth. Many of those points of the teaching may seem strange and startling to those who have studied other teachings, but careful study and consideration will show the truth in spite of the contradictions from without. For the first point, listen to the aphorism. Aphorism 13. Know ye this first truth of metempsychosis. The ego, with a capital E, the true self, is evolved from the personal self. Every living thing, every living thing possesses a personal self. But even among men, many fail to reach egohood. Egohood is earned, not bestowed as a universal natural gift. Many personalities are born, but few egos are evolved. Personality perishes in the astral world after the death of the physical body. Egohood persists in the re-embodiment and rebirth. Now again, when we refer to egohood, I'm adding this myself, we're referring to it with a capital E, the true self. Personality is accompanied or is akin to or aligned with or corresponds to the false ego. So when it says personality perishes in the astral world, it's referring to the false ego. The ego built by the senses, by identification with the material plane, of the physical plane of matter, it is not the true self which is referred to with the capital E here when we refer to when Walker, William Walker Atkinson refers to the ego and egohood. Back to his writing. The startling truth embodied in the aphorism is one of the fundamental principles of the arcane teaching. The majority of religions and philosophies have held to the idea of some of the universality of immortality, although there have been some notable exceptions to the rule. The arcane teaching, however, has always held that egohood, with survival and rebirth, is conditional and exceptional. It is held that there must be earned and evolved an ego, before that ego may persist in re-embodiment and rebirth. Many of the ordinary teachings regarding reincarnation hold that there is a continuous chain of rebirth or reincarnations from the lowest form of animal life, and often still lower, to that of advanced man and beyond. This is not so held in the arcane teaching. 
The arcane teaching holds that there is a physical evolution from the very lowest life forms to the highest, up to a certain advanced stage to be noted hereafter. But that spiritual evolution begins only when the ego is evolved from the personal self of some creature on the plane of humanity, or some plane equal to it in other worlds. I want to interject here. When William Walker Atkinson is referring to evolution, physical evolution, from low forms of life to the highest, he is not here at this point talking about the mechanism of evolution. So he is not necessarily referring to Charles Darwin's uh, mechanism of evolution being uh, mutations or survival of the fittest um, <clears throat> or any other mechanism of evolution. He is simply referring to the evolution that occurs, not how it happens. Now, to continue. From thence on, there is spiritual evolution and metempsychosis, rebirth, or reembodiment, which latter continues until the ego passes through that stage and thenceforth pursues its spiritual evolution without necessity of rebirth. Now, most positively does the arcane teaching deny that you, the ego, as a soul, have arisen by steps of spiritual evolution from the various soul stages of the animal. The arcane teachings also hold that the majority of human beings on earth today have not developed egohood and are therefore not likely to be reborn or re-embodied, re but will, after a period of life in the astral world, in their astral bodies, again die and fade away, being resolved into their original elements in the cosmos. All living things have personality, and are able to distinguish between me and not me, between their personal selves and the things of the outside world, but only a portion of the human race have developed the phase called by psychologists self-consciousness, or the sense of individuality, in which they are able to distinguish between the I and the me. By the me is meant the things of the personality, the body, the things of personality, the body, the mental states, the feelings, the desires, the characteristics of personality, etc., or as I myself have put it, the false ego. By the I is meant that transcendental something in oneself which is able to stand aside and apart and view the me as from outside. That something which enables one to feel I am. That's something which enables one to know that he is superior to the body or to the personality and that he will always be I am, no matter in what part of the cosmos he may be, or after how many eons of time he may say it. It is most difficult to describe this phase of consciousness, but those who have it will recognize it, and those who have it not will likewise, likewise realize the lack. Some may not recognize it under the term ego or I am, but will understand when we say it is that which may be called soul consciousness, that is, a consciousness that you are a soul, inhabiting a body and using a mind, a something over and above personality and mortal life, a something destined to live on and on and on, a something which feels and knows that it is. A great many people who do not recognize this something within them, but instead believe that they have a soul, or will have one at least, their idea of soul being something that will emerge from them after death. The true soul recognizes itself as being now. It can say, I am the soul, here and now. This is egohood in its early stages. The cosmic will, or one life, begins its work of physical evolution, working from lowly forms to higher and higher, the benefits of acquired conscious experience being transmitted through the laws of sequence or heredity. In this way, the lower animals advanced in the scale of evolution, and man appeared. But man was, and in many cases is now, but a higher form of the lower animals, 
His soul life comes later. As man advanced in the scale, there were evolved personalities which experienced the pangs of soul birth. They felt the struggles of the developing something within and began to realize that they were individuals. The I am began to manifest itself. These individuals were not always good people. Both poles of the opposites manifested here as elsewhere. They were simply stronger and more soulful people, people who felt the real self within them. Thus were the egos evolved. When physical death overcame these individuals after spending their allotted and usual time in the astral world and then sinking into astral slumber preceding the usual astral dissolution and final death, these egos awoke to a new life in new bodies, metempsychosis in its earlier stages. Each ego was reborn into a new body along the lines of its general character and desires, although it preserved but a faint memory of its past life. The ego preserved its character, however, although its personality had slipped away from it. Thenceforth, these egos proceeded, proceeded along the lines of spiritual evolution in connection with physical evolution, and thereby the one cosmic life was enabled to evolve and progress along two lines of evolution. Instead of one as before, the cosmic will doubled its resources. In order to see the why and the how of this process of re-embodiment or rebirth, let us listen to the aphorism. Aphorism 14. Know ye the second truth of metempsychosis. Persistence in egohood, in rebirth or re-embodiment, is but the recollection or the memory of the cosmic will in the world brain. As the mortal brain recollects and thus embodies an idea or thing, so does the world brain recollect and thus embodies the egos. This is the truth of metempsychosis and the phases of life beyond metempsychosis. To those who have deemed incapable of solution the how of re-embodiment, the truth contained in the above aphorism will come like a flash of lightning illuminating the darkness of midnight. The analogy is seen at once by those familiar with the laws of the mind and the phenomena of the brain. An idea or thing, the impression of which is in the memory. Occultists claim the memory to be largely astral in its nature, by the way. Is recalled or recollected and immediately passes into the field of consciousness. And to pass into the consciousness field, it must be embodied in the brain substance or cells. It must be given an appropriate body. The cosmic will remembers the ego in the astral world and in the world brain and again embodies it in material form. We urge you to study this carefully and thoroughly before proceeding further in order that you, in order that you may make this great truth your own for all time. Consider this. To be remembered by the cosmic will in the world brain is to persist in being. For whatever is so remembered cannot perish so long as the world brain persists and exists. And now listen to the aphorism telling the third truth of metempsychosis. Aphorism 15. Know ye this third truth of metempsychosis. In recognizing and knowing the I as in I am, the individual recognizes and knows the cosmic will, and the cosmic will knows and recognizes the individual. Egohood is mutual conscious recognition. All below this phase belongs to the subconscious plane of the world brain. In this aphorism is contained another remarkable truth. It informs us that the I am, or I, or soul, recognized by the individual, even faintly, is the conscious recognition of the cosmic will or one life, which is our real self. And likewise, such recognition is mutual, for in it always is comprised the recognition of the individual by the one life. When we know, recognize, and realize the one within us, 
then the one recognizes us within itself. And thenceforth it remembers us. And our spiritual evolution begins. As the aphorism says, egohood is mutual recognition. Mutual recognition between the individual and the all. The aphorism also informs us that below the plane of ego, all the life activities of the world brain are along subconscious lines, below the plane of consciousness. In other words, the being in whom we are knows and, in, and is conscious of us only when we are conscious of being within us, of being, capital B, within us. The recognition, recognition is mutual in consciousness. And correspondingly, as we advance in the great scale of consciousness, we come into a closer recognition and consciousness of the One, and the One comes into a closer recognition and consciousness of us. And finally, at the high noon of cosmic consciousness, we come to know that we are the One, and the One comes to know that it is us. And toward this is the aim and goal of spiritual evolution. But not all the egos reach this stage. Many fall by the wayside or sink into the mire. We shall speak in the, of this in the succeeding lesson. And we mention it here merely to prevent a misapprehension. The arcane teaching does not hold that rebirth is imposed arbitrarily upon the ego or by reason of punishment or reward for, evils, for, for deeds good and evil of the physical life. But on the contrary that it proceeds in accordance with the operation of the seven laws following the general path of the desire and character of the individual. In other words, the character of the individual, which is composed of the sum of his experience and his desires, follows the line of the general expression of his desires in deciding his future embodiments and life. Desire is the strong motive force of life as we shall explain in a future lesson, and its urge toward expression leads him into certain channels of rebirth. An understanding of desire and the will enables the individual to regulate his character so that he may practically map out his future lives instead of allowing them to be determined by blinded desire, as is the case with the majority of the race. Nor does the arcane teaching hold that metempsychosis shall always continue along unconscious lines. The advanced soul reaches the plane of conscious rebirth after a certain stage is passed, and accompanying this comes the memory of past lives, so that life becomes continuous in consciousness and memory after a certain stage of progress is attained. At present, the average ego is undergoing a stage of spiritual evolution akin to the mental stage of a child of a few years of age. The child remembers but little of its past. The happenings of a few months ago are forgotten. Even the affairs of yesterday seem dim today. But as the child advances in years, it has a better and still better remembrance of the past. And in the same way, the advancing soul develops a clearer and still clearer recollection of past lives. The dim memories, the flashes of remembrance of the past, which many of us now have, will be succeeded eventually by a full remembrance of the details of our past lives. Moreover, the arcane teaching does not hold that metempsychosis is the final stage of spiritual evolution, no. On the contrary, it holds that eventually the evolving ego will reach the stage in which re-embodiment is no longer necessary and thenceforth the ego will be, actually, will, a, will be able to actually create its own bodily vehicle of life from the principle of substance in which it is immersed. The arcane teaching also hold that re-embodiment on this one planet continues only so long as the ego is attracted by earth things. When it passes beyond the attractions of earth, it rises to meet the attractions of worlds higher in the plane, and so on and on. Or likewise, it may become so gross that it may sink to a lower level of worlds beneath our own in development. 
Many of us now abiding on this planet have been drawn here by reason of having fallen from the higher estate of higher worlds by reason of our material longings. This accounts for the feeling possessed by many that they are far from home. Accompanied by dim and bitter flashes of remembrance of a brighter, happy, and more glorious life on some higher plane in the past. But the lesson will be heeded, and these lost souls who are strangers far from home will follow the kindly light which will lead them on to home once more. The arcane teaching holds that the dual nature in individuals, the two natures struggling for supremacy, arise from the struggle between the I, which is the reincarnated ego, and the me, which is the personality received along the lines of heredity, ancestral race, thought, etc. The I is the real self. The me is the personality which has been inherited. The character of the individual arises from the balance struck between the two. The weak soul allows the me to bear down the balance in its own direction, while the strong soul asserts the I and seats itself upon the throne of individuality. The very fact of the existence of such a struggle between the me and the I of the individual shows that there must be an I or ego superior to and in a measure independent of the inherited and acquired me. And the fact that the individual experiences this dual nature is his proof that he has attained at least some degree of egohood. For those of the race who lack egohood are like the lower animals and simply follow inherited and racial desires. The only conflict in the minds of those that are lacking egohood is the conflict between opposing desires of this kind. There is no I to set aside desire or to master it by will. The strong ego is able to master desire by will, able not only to desire to will, but to will to will. Desire and will are the two poles of the manifestation of will with a capital W. Desire rules the individual unless he masters it by will. The ego may assert its will over the inherited desires of the me or the false self. Personality is connected with the physical body and its physical inheritances and acquired tendencies. Individuality is connected with the ego or the real self which is over and above personality, or the things of personality. Personality is bound and tied by the relative things and persons connected with one's personal present incarnation. Individuality is free from those bonds, ties, and limitations, and soars above them in its cosmic flight. Personality says, I am John Doe of Akron, a grocer, aged 48. Or Mary Rowe, spinster, age 45, as the case may be. Individuality says, I am the, that which I am. Above names and forms and personal sheaths or vehicles. Each ego has been embodied in numerous personalities during the spiritual evolution. Old Atlantis, Chaldea, Egypt, Greece, and other lands have known us. Rome, Tyre, Carthage, Babylon, Troy, and other cities of the past have been ours. We have worshipped Jove, Isis, Thor, Woden, Baal, Pan, and many other strange gods. We have learned many lessons. We have had many defeats. We have had many victories. And we are now emerging into a conscious realization of what it all means. We have reached the point where we shall have some say in the matter. We are facing the cosmic adventure with open eyes and bold hearts. We are going on and on and on. The dawn of the cosmic knowing is upon us. The light is rising over the hills, bidding us awake to the tasks of the day. Let neither time nor space terrify us. Let nations vanish and worlds disappear. What is that to us? The cosmos is our home, all parts of space our own, 
all time ours to live in and employ. All the time there is, all the space there is, all the knowledge there is, is ours to have and to hold. All this is the heritage of him who can say and feel, I am. That is the end of lesson eight.